Welcome to the podcast, Melody and Friends, where I will be taking a virtual tour around the world, interviewing all kinds of wonderful people. And today we land in Texas, actually Dallas, Texas, to meet my new friend, Karen, to talk about redeeming love, restoration, reconciliation, and healing after betrayal. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much, Melody. I'm so, I'm so thrilled to be on here today with you. Yeah, so- we, we got to speak just a little bit before we even started this, and I can already feel the the kindredness of just traveling a similar story. Totally. Sisters forever, right? I mean, yes. once yes, we're in this part of this club, it's, uh, you know, it's the one we never <laughs> wanted to be in, but, but like we gain these beautiful sisters, right? And yes, we really do. We really do. So for people that don't know anything about Karen, tell us a little bit about you and just your story. Okay. Gosh, where do I start? It's a long story. <laughs> but, um, let's see. So I, yeah, I grew up in Southern California as did my husband, I met him at 15 years old, okay. was not looking for him, <laughs> but you know, I was kind of left my, I was the youngest in my family of three and I, we lived right there by the beach and I had a free for all. My mom and dad worked full time. So I met him at the beach and he was five years older, my sister's age. So she knew him and um, we just kind of, you know, what we thought fell madly in love or whatever, you know, and uh, um, I, I say, you know, not so much intimacy, but intensity kind of, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and we were not Christian. We were, we were not raised that, but either of us. So we didn't have God. And so I, I mean, we did drugs. We drank a lot. We did, I mean, not saying that Christians don't, but you know, <laughs> I mean, I just wasn't given any of that. In fact, my parents are from England and they're actually kind of the opposite. <laughs> it was kind of a free for all. So, you know, and I learned that later as we'll get into my story, you know, how some of that played along, but um, yeah. And my husband, well, he had five alcoholic fathers. So um, I think his mom was married six times actually, but twice to his, uh, his biological father. So, you know, back then I was clueless. I did not you know, no. And he was that great guy that forgave him and just had this great attitude. So I didn't think anything of it. Right. And, um, there were issues immediately. There was pornography, there was, um, you know, magazines, um, cases of them, but again, I didn't know. And I wasn't, I was raised just to think that was pretty much normal and, um, lots of, you know, girls, the beach, the lusting, like all of that. And I knew it always bothered me and and I was so young so obviously I, I saw some of the magazines and thinking mm, I'll never be that you know because I was just so young and tiny little thing and um and so that was always there there was phone calls from strippers and, and things like that along the way lots of drinking not coming home at night and things and and we ended up living together when I was 16 so I mean it's crazy to say that now as a mom of six kids it's like I would never let my kids do that but I lived in a different world. So um, it was a very free world. So (laughs) I got in a lot of trouble real quick, but then we ended up getting married by the time I was 18. So, um, and so then like life started to change there because we were actually still partying, but my husband actually was, we were sitting in a bar one night and he said, let's settle down and have a kid. And we did. (laughs) And so we always say though, it was like through her that, that our joy and purpose in life, like really started to, because I didn't really have a purpose. I mean, I wanted to be an architect. That was one thing. And my mom worked for a huge architecture firm, but, um, and my husband was a contractor. So he was just starting out his own business. So we kind of were this little team and, um, but we ended up having our baby and that like, she just brought so much joy and we ended up going to church for her. So that's kind of the drive by this church every, every week or whatever. And I just had this nudging in my heart to take her. So, um, so we did. And, and both of our hearts were, you know, God opened both of our eyes and hearts together, which was also a blessing. And we kind of both went full head in to God. And, um, and when it was beautiful, and then my husband started to really get successful with construction, kind of probably too quick for his own bridges. You know, I mean, he was bringing me home a BMW, like things that was just crazy. I was not raised that way. Either was he. So it was kind of out of control, but I didn't realize it again at that time. And, um, you know, and he, he didn't drink a lot because he came from such alcohol, so much alcohol, but then there started to be times like he would drink and it would be a problem. And he had an anger problem. And again, there was just always these underlying factors and issues, but I never really, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know, you know, and I used to be hard on myself about that. Right. Like I should have known, but today I give myself grace because, you know, we're just all doing the best we can with what we have and how we were raised and how we were shaped and all of those things. And, 
And so, and my husband learned to put on the mask, as you probably, you know, are familiar with, right? I mean, we all take on these roles and, um, and he was that great guy and he had this great personality and he was just Mr. Positive, toxic positivity, really. Um, and, you know, and so, but we had this like kind of exciting, fun life because he's not starting to make money. We went on to have four kids and, um, you know, we were well known in our community through business, through our kids, through sports, all of that. And then church as well. And I started leading Bible studies as time went on. And, and then we ended up finding this beautiful property, like two blocks from our church. And it was like my favorite street. It was Strawberry Lane. And my little kids would be like, we're going down Mommy Street again. <laughs> and, you know, Strawberry Lane. And it was just like these beautiful properties with like two, three acres. I mean, in California, 15 minutes from the beach, that was a rare find. Wow. And we were growing out of our homes. Excuse me. So, um, so sure enough, one day I heard somebody was going to sell something. And I went over there and we ended up getting like the worst house on the street. And it was affordable. And so here we were, we lived in the home for three years. I mean, it was kind of junky, but we lived in it. And then my husband was like, let's tear this sucker down and you design it. I'll build it. I always joke. We were kind of like the Chip and Joanna of the day before, but we didn't know it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I literally built a, and designed a farmhouse. I mean, it, you know, back then in California, that was kind of really unheard of. It was white. It was beautiful. It looked like a Connecticut or English farmhouse, I say. And from the English heritage, and yeah, I was wondering it, if you brought in some of your, your parents. Uh, totally, parents totally. Paper. I don't know if you can see in the back there, see all my antiques in the yes. back? Yes. Those are all English antiques right there, pewter and uh, English ironstone. Nice. So yes, I have a lot of that heritage is a lot about me as a person. And if you're into the Enneagram, I'm Enneagram four, and it's exactly, it says like that we love, like, you know, to be unique and these you know, kind of nostalgia and stuff. So it's incredible. Well, and everything has meaning. I mean, that's what everything so has meaning. That's yeah. so true. Yeah. That is so true. I never hear that much, but that is, oh my gosh, that's so me. <laughs> Maybe too much so, but <laughs> um, and, and I'm all about my feelings, right? Yeah. Um, and then I married a seven who doesn't do feelings, right? <laughs> He's well, all it's really yeah. funny. I, I'm a seven, but sometimes I'm like, I grew up with a dad that was a counselor. So I'm like, I'm oh. kind of the, I guess the, you know, the, yeah, a good mix, the, the healthy the mix. Off person of seven. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. And that's good. Cause sevens when they get, you know, but they're fun, they're fun people. See, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, and I have seven in me too, but and anyway, I have four in me too. So maybe that's I mean, why we that's probably why we're getting spirits there. Yes, totally. Because I, yeah, yeah one of them said four, seven, nine or something, but in, and I am that fun girl and I love all that, you know, too. But, um, and so anyway, it ended up being on the cover of country home, country living. And, that, and I got to design it. So that was even, I went to school for architecture, but then I stopped and got married and had kids. So, so it was kind of like my baby. It was really special that, you know, that I was really proud, proud of it. But right around that time, I remember being in the airport and my husband, like me being so excited because I didn't, they didn't tell me it was like on the cover. And we were in the airport and we were flying out to Austin because our daughter went to college and he wasn't that excited. Like he was not like things started to shift around that time. And he just wasn't really that into like me and our kids and kind of the vibe in the home was changing and he was drinking more. And then he gave me a 40th birthday party and he got wasted drunk, hung all over another man's wife. Hmm. When I walked outside, he didn't acknowledge me the entire night. It was so painful. Um, you know, I mean, they're basically kissing and and then he saw me and then they didn't stop and they just kept going and it was so awkward and he ended up getting sick all night long and I take the kids back to the airport and things like that. And that was probably like a pivotal moment of where I kind of say it bookends or like where things really started to go awry because it was like now he was making these choices of drinking and there was, you know, the stuff happening, crossing boundaries with women. And it, it had been all like there were like lunches with women and there were these things that were always sort of there in my gut that did not feel right. But that was like a pivotal moment. And when I had the pain and brought it to him, that's when everything changed because he doesn't do pain. Mm. He was taught to turn off pain. Yeah. He witnessed his mother being beaten. He, I mean, he's very, you know, was very open about our story. And he, um, yeah, and he was, I mean, his mom, every time she got married, he never knew of a wedding. He didn't go to a wedding. He never said goodbye to a man. So, I mean, everything was shoved under the rug wow. and, and feelings weren't dealt with. So, and he had a lot of losses there. His own father was in jail. Um, and he was, you know, even he remembers two, three years old being like scared of his dad because of what he would hear. And then he was like four and mom told him, you're going to go see your dad today. 
Um, like, what does that do to a little boy, right? I mean, and they didn't go away. They reframe. <laughs> exactly. And so he, and he distinctly remembers like his dad hugging him and saying, I love you, son. And he remembers going, I don't even know you. You know what I mean? Like, but there, but he also became that guy that like connected to strangers because he had to, because they became his fathers and stuff. And so um, all that to say, you know, he had a lot of traumas and I always say there's never excuse for right. anything they right. do, right. but it's just an understanding. Yes. And, and as, this is all, as I look back now, I didn't get it then. Right. right. I'm, you know, as these things were playing out, in fact, when his dad passed away on Christmas day, and this was after we were married and had a new baby. Um, so I had met him and things. He got given us a small box. His dad didn't have any money. He, you know, he, he, he struggled and he was alcoholic and all that. So, but all he, he got like a ring and he got the pornography tape. And I remember years later, our counselor was saying, so the only thing you had in common with your father is pornography. Yep. So, I mean, what a sad, you know, in my head, and he couldn't even think of a positive thing years later in counseling to really say anything good that he got from his yeah. biological father. So that again was a lot. And again, not to excuse anything, but just trying to set the stage for how he was shaped, you know, and our differences where my parents were, I didn't have a perfect childhood and I had neglect and I was a latchkey kid, but my parents gave us a lot of love. And my mom and dad were married for 68 years until I lost my dad a year and a half ago. So they had this beautiful love and I saw a lot of consistency and conflict was resolved well. And they just did a really good example on what love and a healthy relationship looks like. And so not perfect, but, but just a, you know, beautiful one. I mean, they danced their entire life and marriage, you know, like it kind of set me up maybe for a little bit idealizing, you know, like the little Disney because, and I was that girl because I'm a four, I'm like romantic and you know, that is <laughs> a romantic, and, you know, and it was like, I did, I idealized that stuff. I'm used to play with my friends and we'd pretend, you know, where our husbands were and all the things. So, so here I am and we're, you know, we've got this beautiful big house and he's, you know, drinking, he's, I'm catching him watching pornography and I'm still, I don't understand like the struggle of all of it. Um, and he'd always give me an excuse and minimize and that whole thing, you know? And meanwhile, he's leading men's groups and I mean, you know, church men's Bible studies and I'm leading Beth Moore Bible studies, you know, large groups and I'm on the ministry team and we got all our kids and people come to our home. So we dedicate our home for, you know, youth group and all of that. And, um, and then things just started to just get uglier and uglier. I mean, it was like, he wasn't coming home at night. And uh, we ended up, once our daughter went to Baylor out here, we ended up buying a ranch um, out near Chapel Hill, in, kind of near Houston. And, he, you know, he would go out there and say he was, you know, working on the ranch. And so, I mean, I was, I was excited about that because it was going to be a place for our future grandkids and family and stuff because we loved Texas. And, but he would just not come home. He'd turn off his phone and just not come home. I mean, that's where I started to lose myself. Right. I mean, well, it's, crazy it's, crazy it's crazy making. It's crazy making. And it's, it's completely it's, crazy making. It's crazy yeah. Making. You know, and like the, what I know now, right. My nervous system for so many years was just always on high alert. I didn't have safety and I would call and call and call and I get nothing. Yeah. And, um, it was just, it was, it was horrific really. And, you know, and we would have like church events or kids events and he would just not show up and he would not come home and he would not answer his phone. And, and so I was just always, you know, in survival mode. And then he came home and he, he start you know, he was really after that birthday and so he was really very verbally and emotionally abusive. So now he was neglecting me. Now he was emotionally and verbally abusive. Yeah. Um, he'd get very angry, you know, and I know some guys kind of have the underground thing and it's very passive aggressive and they never know a thing. And they've got this great guy, Christian, you know, thing in at church and all that. Well, my husband had that, but at the home, it was chaos. And, and, but it, no one saw that other than my kids. Now my kids saw way too much. Yeah. I didn't understand boundaries. I knew nothing about boundaries. Yeah. Right. And so I started to lose myself. And I really, and I started to, you know, try to please and appease and, and I had so much fear, right. And again, fear of disconnection and fear of loss. And I couldn't understand really what was happening. And so I would try and try and try and overcompensate and 
all of those things. And again, I would get often, I would get no response. And what I always say is silence is violence because yes. non-responsiveness to a nervous system, you know, and the attachment system, right? I mean, are you there for me? You know, will you respond when I call? Are you engaged and attuned and all of that? And it was nothing. I mean, he was just shut down, shut out and say, I mean, he was doing it with the kids too. And so that well, and a lot of people just, let me interject real quick. A lot of people don't understand that silence and the passive aggressive approach and the indifference it's abuse and it's psychological Absolutely. abuse because you think Absolutely. when somebody speaks to you, you speak back, you communicate back. Correct. You're and, responsive. Yes. And this other person is supposed to protect you. Exactly. And this person is not only pro- not protecting you, they're hurting you. And That's so right. it's just, it's and their patterns, they see patterns of harm over time. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the big, you know, it, maybe it's not abuse if it's a one-time blow up or a one time he doesn't come home or whatever, but when it's pat becomes patterns yes. over and over in the harm, and that is the attachment injury with someone, you know, they're our person, they're supposed to be our survival person, yeah. right? Yeah. And God forbid a 9-11 happens or whatever, and, and now they're not there and they're not answering. Right. So there's, you know, yeah, there's a lot of damage that happens there. And I was, so I was already feeling abandoned. I was again, losing myself in, you know, in trying to, you know, over try. And, you know, I know today that God does not condone, you right. know, ever or call us to lose ourselves for right. our marriage. Right. Like that right. is, not, right. you know, and abuse is not okay. I love when I have one of the shirts, I think it's Patrick Weaver Ministries and it says, God hates divorce and cross out divorce and says abuse. And I wear it a lot because I mean, it's true, you know? Yeah, of course yeah. God doesn't, you know, want divorce, but that's a part of life too, as you know. Right. And there, you know, there's lots of- um, He never values a life over marriage exactly, a life exactly. always comes first and exactly if you lose your life in relationship with another person and i'm not saying like die but no but exactly. when you're in a psychological abusive relationship Absolutely. over time you're you you kill your heart and you're like a walking exactly. Dead person so, exactly yeah. Yeah, exactly yeah. and you can't parent and all of those things and so yeah and that was happening all the time and you know and i mean he would say horrific things and again i was devalued i was not seen and then what does that do that brings up all these negative core beliefs you know, I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. And this was not who I was. I mean, I had self-confidence. I, you know, and it was just, it was just crazy making. And I remember thinking if people knew, I mean, he was the vice president of a homeless shelter he built, Mm. you know, he was known out there. And I mean, he took groups to Katrina, like all these things. And I'm sitting here being abused and neglected and dismissed and left alone with their children. And you know, some of my close friends started to see, but it was still very, you know, it was hard. You know, I was scared. I was afraid. I had shame, right? We often carry a lot of their shame and blame and pain. And he was blaming me as well. So he was telling me. How old are the kids at this point? Oh, I mean, young when it started. I mean, the youngest, the two youngest we adopted, we had the four, then we adopted two. And the youngest was two years old when that magazine came out. And that's when things started to change. I would share a story. Um, you know, like about them and like the house and like how God and all the things. And he, he used to love the story. And then he started looking at me with contempt. And it was just, I just knew something was so, you know, happening, but I could not control it. And again, today I'm like, you know, what's within your control, what's not right. And what's your responsibility, what's not. But I didn't understand any of that back then. I did not know that I had no emotional safety. Yeah. I didn't know that, you know, I was not safe to share my pain and boy, did I try and try and try and try and try and try. I mean, the hours that I spent trying to resolve this conflict, to talk yeah. about my heart, to share, you know, and, and it's like, and he, I would get stonewalled. I would get dismissed. I would get, you know, he would create the distance, the intimacy, anorexia or avoidance, you know, just severe yeah. extreme. Again, I can understand it now from his childhood, but while it was happening, I did not understand he doesn't do pain, you know? Right, right. Just shoved right. under the rug. But what do they say? Whatever's shoved under the rug never dies, you right. know, and it's going to come out. And so he, and he'll tell you, he built up a whole story and judgment against me and had contempt and resentment and bought all those lies, put walls around his heart because he's not going to go there into feeling and right. just, you know, made these judgments and then called me judgmental, you know, for him, because I was feeling so unsafe. I didn't feel safe when he, he'd he go hunting, fishing, surfing. He had property in Mexico. I didn't even know. 
I had never been. So, I mean, there was like things happening. I would find checks. He borrowed $80,000 from someone. And, you know, I wasn't allowed to use my voice and speak it. I had no consent. There was no mutuality. Yeah. Th- those types of things that, again, I didn't understand were abuse. And I did not get raised in that. Right, so right. That's kind of like, okay. And then later again, I, and I'm not here to blame anyone, but, you know, I looked at like, where was that familiar? What was familiar in, in this? Because we pair bond and it's not, yeah. it's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not, it's no one's fault, but we tend to go to something familiar. That's it. Because we're human. Yeah. You could be the best therapist and you're still going to do that, you know? And, and I realized, well, I had, there was some neglect because I was home a lot and it was free for all. And my, my older sister, she was four, John's age, four and a half years older. And she was the middle child. And she had a lot of emotional issues with my parents over things. And even like some jealousy with me, when I was born, all these things. And so she had a lot of instability emotionally mentally and she would have she would be running away and I remember as a little girl grabbing her keys you know so that's where again I don't I'm not to blame for any of John's behavior but that is I learned to try to make things good and and be that pleaser and I took on that role we all take on roles you know and again that's not with any judgment or any shame it's just that's the role I took on it wasn't was it my authentic self no right that right so you know but that's what I learned to do. So then there I was in my coping mechanism, you know, doing that in my marriage. And, um, and again, I did the best I could with what I had, but it wasn't really working for me, (laughs) you know? And so that's where, you know, it, it, things started getting so bad that I was living in such fear of disconnection from him and fear of him leaving because he would leave a lot. And so, well, and I, I mean, I, I share the horse story. I don't know if you've heard my little horse story. I can make it really short and quick, but I got a lot, a lot of people have heard it, but it's just, to me, it's very powerful because it was one of those times he had not, he was not coming home. You know, he'd been gone for two, three weeks and his secretary is calling me panicking, freaking out, needing to talk to him. You know, he's kind of letting his business go at this time. And he, we're in the height of our success. And it's like, just let it be and let go, you know, cause he's up to no good, but I don't know exactly what. And so, um, I call and call and call. Well, he finally answers and all, you know, whatever business we had to take care of was taken care of. And then all he said to me, two sentences, well, I got to go. Um, my legs are tired. I've been hunt- hunting all day. And oh, by the way, sugar, our horse, he's um, not neglected anymore. I always remember neglect because I remember going, I'm neglected, but he's, he's not neglected anymore. And he's gotten strong. Just want you to know. And that was it. <laughs> so, um, and he hung up the phone, most random conversation I've ever had. Well, I'm like distraught afterwards because I'm like, he's gone for two, three weeks yeah. and he's not even caring about my pain, my heart, my kid, our kids, nothing. And so I like roll over and I see his Bible that I'd given him. And my, and at this time he's walking away from God as well. So I'm watching this man who loved God, who went to Katrina, who was praying with people is now kind of like, yeah, I'm not so interested. I'm like, wow. So anyway, I'm looking through the Bible to encourage myself and just crying my eyes out in my big, beautiful dream home alone. Um, And I'm going through and all of a sudden it opens up to Psalms and I'm looking for a heading and it's Psalm 147 and it says, Jesus heals the brokenhearted. So I start reading it out loud to myself as I'm crying to encourage myself. It wasn't really applying to me, but some reason God just had me keep reading. And I get to verse 10 and 11 and it says, it's not in the legs of a man or the strength of a horse, but those whose hope is steadfast in the Lord. Wow. And that was a pivotal moment for me because it was like, okay, God, you see me. How, what were the chances of this man in sin, in the pit? God used him to say those two things. Wow. He's never said those two things in our life. My legs are tired and the horse is strong. And then, and then out of all the Bible verses in the Bible, I open it up to a random thing. And there it is. It's not in the legs of a man or the strength of a horse, but those who hope is steadfast in the Lord. Now, what kind of encouragement that did that give me? Did it change my outcome? Did it change my problem? No, things were hard for like the next eight years plus, but it, I never forgot that. And I, it took my eyes off of him. 
yeah. and more unto God. And, and again, I'm not here about over-spiritualizing either because I know there's been lots of harm in that too. And, yeah. but this was just like a little, you know, uh, almost a reality check for me too, right? Like my yeah. husband is not my God and I can't control him, but my hope needs to be in God for me, for my, my sanity, for my stability, for my safety, for, you know, for yeah. me to get well. So that, that was sort of like a pivotal point for me to start looking at me and God and letting go of him, you know, and it was still a journey. I wasn't there yet. And then it was on a mother's day weekend that he ended up leaving. And we had been to a counselor a couple of times and, you know, he would give me a couple of breadcrumbs. <laughs> and so then I would think we're going to be okay, you know, and then, no. and so, but that counselor, <laughs> yeah, that counselor helped me though. Cause he, he helped me create some boundaries. And he said, John, if this happens again, like you're not coming back, you can't just keep leaving and caring, right? We all agree. And so that's what we all agreed on. And so there, my son told me he was about nine at the time. Now we're fast forward in like five years. And he said, mommy, daddy went surfing in Mexico. And it was like a third, it was like the day after um, Cinco de Mayo. I'll never forget it. And I was like, what? I mean, it was mother's day. Right. And we had been struggling and I thought I was having that little bit of hope. And he, I'm like, he's gone. Wow. And he left me on mother's day and wow, he knows he's not coming back. Cause he, we agreed. Yeah. So my heart, my heart broke into a million pieces that day. I mean, and I didn't know how I was going to, you know, keep it together with my six kids. I had kids coming in from college, flying in and all the things. And I was just so broken wow. and it was so, so painful. Um, and then they went back to school in the airport and all that. And on that Monday morning, I'll never forget. It, I sat outside. I mean, I sat in this beautiful little nook kitchen that I had looking over this beautiful rolling hills and horses and goats and stuff we had and chickens and peacocks. And my whole life was shattered wow. and my dreams were all shattered. And I was the most broken, you know, and I didn't understand that I, I was abandoned. I mean, that is so, I mean, that was such trauma. But I, again, I didn't know that was that. I was just knew I was devastated and there was yeah. so much destruction and I couldn't believe my husband at this point at 26 years did not care. He did not care. And he will tell you, he could not feel a thing, not a thing. So for weeks, I would be calling him, texting him, crying, screaming, begging, you name it, with zero, zero response. Did your what? church ever get involved? Hmm. Yeah, don't get me started with that. That's a whole nother story, a whole nother podcast. I will oh, we'll, we'll do a second podcast. Yes, can okay. share our I reached out for the first time in 26 years at that church mm -hmm. that I served, that we had 200 kids at our home every week. Yeah. That I led Bible study, you name it, never asked a thing. And they didn't know what to do with me. So they just yeah. passed me on and then they forgot about me. Yeah. All I wanted and needed was Karen, we see you. We care. How can we pray for you? And how can we support you with the kids? That's all I needed. I did not get it. I'm so sorry. Oh, you. Thank you. I mean, it's, you know, and so I do relate to those who have yeah. had the harm. And I, again, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't have some of those harms, like some, but here I was so faithful to for 26. And like, that's the thing. It was another betrayal. Yeah. And it's, it's the biggest betrayals. You know, yes. I had a church that walked with us the first time and it was incredible and then a church that did horrible horrible job and so yeah when your husband betrays you and then your spiritual authority yeah you go to in hopes to get some sort of covering because yep. your husband is you know mia and not providing the, the the comfort and the care and the protection and then your church doesn't it's it's so it was it was painful I mean there's some stories where you know I ran into a couple of the pastors the youth pastors in Starbucks and they were like how you doing and I remember thinking wait don't they know and so I I while I was waiting for my drink I wait I went over there and I was like well you guys know John left me right and they said oh yeah we heard and it, and it was just like, it was just that much more painful. And there's a little story to that, but it was, you know, it was hurtful. It was, and it was like, and, and my friends did the best, you know, some of my friends were awesome, but a lot of the community that we were well known in just, I did feel abandoned. And yeah. so, you know, and, and I also know people, my family and people and my sister had been divorced a couple of times. So like, she was like, welcome to my world. So then it was like, oh my goodness, you know, like it was just so yeah, it was like crazy, you know, like you yeah. just get hurt by others on top of it. And so I felt so alone. 
But again, that's where, like you said, you know, God, God was drawing near to my heart. Yeah. And again, I'm all about, it's okay to ha- wrestle with God. Many right. people do wrestle with their faith in God for, for just some reason. I felt like all I had was God. And yeah. so I did feel comfort and closeness with him in this time. And so that's kind of who I clung on to. And I finally started to, after weeks of reaching out to John and him not responding, I decided to say, here you go, God, I am done. You can have him. <laughs> I am done. You get to whack him over the head. I'm, I got to let go of the outcome. Yeah. This is killing me. I recognized it was killing me. I was having this, this crazy chaos with my phone and me. He's not in the picture and I'm crying and calling and texting and, and begging. And he's not responding. And like, it was like my wake up call. It was like in a kind way, but it was like, but, uh, but I like, you know, whoa, like he, it's me in the phone. <laughs> so it was like, okay, I, this, I was very proud of myself. I, I said to myself, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to be emotional with him. He doesn't get to have my emotions. This is not working for me anyway. So I had to start like slowly letting go. And I've had lots of blips and mess ups and all that too. But I really committed to myself to not reach out and not share my heart. Just I need a check or this or that. And, you know, he wasn't really nice about all of that. There was, he was paying for all the home and all the, you know, the kids in college, but he was very cruel with money. And so things were tight, even though I'm living in this big house and blah, blah, blah. And yet I would be at a bank crying because I had no money. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Yeah. Yep. But God was good because we used to yeah. use our home for um, photo shoots for like Target and stuff. And I would get cash and I had th- that same pastor that helped me with the boundaries. He lived in Santa Barbara and he told me, you don't have to give him the money. And I'd always got freely given him the money. So I was like, I, you know, God provided, I, I was able to, you know, work through that. And, and then, you know, it was mother's day. So I waited until um, the fall when all my kids went back to school and I found an amazing counselor and I knew I needed help. I knew I had six kids looking at me. They were broken too. They were abandoned too. Yeah. So then I started That's what to I think a lot of times kids don't really reconcile until they get older, because, you know, if mom is hurting and they're still trying to figure it out, how do I love both parents or whatever that looks like? They don't really realize every time he left you or every time he betrayed you, he actually did that to the kids as well. And that's a exactly. real hard thing when they get older to understand I was abandoned. I was lied to. I was Yep. you know, abused as well. I mean, the abuse is different because it's a lot of emotional neglect, but that's still exactly. abuse. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And so, um, yeah. And so it was like, okay. So she was great with me because she would pray with me for him on her knees with me, which was very, yeah. but she kept me in truth and reality. Yeah. So that, you know, and I had to do the hard work and this was sort of pre-betrayal trauma. This was 11 years ago. So it, it was kind of right before. And so I wasn't being told it was trauma and things like that, but, sure. but, uh, you know, I was doing some work and, you know, and looking at those core negative beliefs and, and, and there was some real aha moments of, you know, I did feel insignificant as in my child family of origin and, and through this abandonment trauma, I also, I mean, if that doesn't tell you're insignificant, I don't know what does, right? So, yeah. you know, a lot of us get, have those core negative beliefs, some of them, which we had maybe in childhood and just from childhood. And then of course this, you know, compounds it and adds to it. And then some of our core negative beliefs, like I had, I'm unworthy. That came only from my marriage. I did not have that ever, right? So we get these core negative beliefs that we start to believe right? And me and the line and all of those things. And, you know, again, so I was starting to like, you know, recognize I needed to, to get myself empowered. I had been so disempowered for so many years. And so I went weekly and I went into, you know, a couple, you know, kind of like celebrate recovery, like some of those kind of groups. That's all I had at the time. I did not have, you know, groups. I didn't know the extent of his, you know, I knew there was porn and pornography and pornography, masturbation, lust, like those things and crossing line with lines with women all along, but I just didn't really understand. And, but I started to get well, 
And I, I really was in my truth. I, I think it's so important to, I mean, in our reality, you know, yeah. to sort, to live in our facts and truth uh -huh. and just to recognize like, you know, when I'm, this is the story I'm making up, but this is the meaning. And is it true? You know, and really like slow everything down. Right. Like I said, letting go of the outcome. Like it was hard to sit in the middle of the unknown as you know, you probably know and not have, you know, I'm married, but I don't have a husband. Right. And so what a, I felt so in the middle there. So I talk about that a lot, the messy middle, like it is messy and it's muddy and it's, you know, and I was slopping through mud and I did not know my future. And I went to a lawyer and I got some wisdom and I, you know, I had to make sure I was going to protect my kids and, yeah. and myself. And, and it turned out with him having his own business and the cost and having properties in Mexico, it was going to just be this huge thing. And he wasn't going to have to pay for the kids school private Christian school and the college. So the, I got my answer. I walked out of there so clear that I'm not going to file today. I mean, like, or, you know, anytime soon that, so I had to give myself that permission. We right. have to do that a lot, right? Give us, and, and, you know, your story might be different than mine. I know lots of women that need to file. So yeah. it's yeah. all different, right? But we have to stop and say, what's best for me. That's right. You know, That's right. and where could I, where do I need to give myself permission? And so I had to give myself permission to grieve and to, you know, feel these losses to, um, you know, and to make decisions for myself now right. without him. Um, I had to give myself grace for the mistakes I made. I mean, some of my kids right. were involved, wanted to talk about, I mean, there was that stuff too. You know, it's like, we just, again, do the best I could with what I have or whatever. Um, I started to learn about internal boundaries, what internally Right. Because what happens like a war within our soul breaks out, don't you think? It's like because our values, our faith, family, God, like all these things. And then all these years I'm living in this nightmare. Right. right. It's not really, really working out to faith, family, God, the way that I hoped it would. Right. And it's not funny. But I mean, it's just like, but it's so, it's so, it causes so much conflict internally. Yeah. Right. Because it's like, I didn't want to be alone. I didn't choose this. I don't want all the things. Right. It's like, then my reality is, but yeah, but he's not choosing you or God. And, right. you know, and like, this is your reality and, and you don't even know what he's doing and all the things. And so the more I got into that, the more clear I got, the more I let go of his stuff. What's not my responsibility, you know, his whatever is not my responsibility, his gas line, his line. And I recognized I started to be off the crazy train. I didn't know it until I stopped with the crazy texting right. and I started to feel so empowered because I would just be like, he'd be like a put check in the mailbox and be like, thanks, nothing else. And, and what I didn't know was that silence for him, that leaving him be was probably the, was the best thing I could have done anyway. It was boundaries for my own sanity, but it also, it wasn't to do anything for him or manipulate, but he, he did notice I went to my way. So, it, you know, he's thinking he's having his cake and he had two and he's got me over here begging for him, you know, all the stuff. Right. And now I'm getting stronger. I built my inner core strength. So I'm big about that. You know, we got to build that up. We've got to build, got to live in our worth and live in our truth and, and, you know, and just know our reality and, you know, do, and do we have different realities? We had completely different realities, yeah. you know? And again, I had a lot of shame because the whole community saw and we're talking. Mm -hmm. So I worried about that for a while. Like, what will they think? What are they thinking of me? They thinking I didn't give them enough sex, like all the things. Right. And I was that girl who did all of those things. I, I took care of my husband. And I remember sitting in a church um, with the pastor's mom and her saying, honey, if you take care of your husband, he will never cheat on you. And I remember going, what? Like what, you know, and more distortion, you know, not true at all, not true at all. And so, um, but I just started to, to really focus on my own healing journey and what I needed yeah. and what was okay. And what wasn't I had, it was my responsibility now to protect my children. Right. right? So he was not seeing them regularly at all. So I had to say, if you're not seeing them regularly, you don't get to see him. The younger two, the older kids, he had already broken that whole relationship with. So that was done. And just, you know, I was reeling in from all the impact of all of this. I mean, it was so much chaos. I have autoimmune issues, you know, like a lot of us do. Um, was it Gabor Mate? I love that. 
some of his stuff, he talks about, you know, like yeah. if we don't deal with our emotions, right. you know, well, our body's going to tell us no for us and right. it's going to come out in sickness. Yep. So, you know, and so I don't know if you have any of those issues, but I had girl issues. I had lots of issues over many years and have a lot of inflammation and all that. And, you know, I go to a functional doctor and all those things, but, you know, there was just so many years of living in fight flight and, you know, out of that window of tolerance and survival mode and my nervous system completely out of whack, you know? So, um, but I started to learn to take care of me, my self-care, um, you know, and to speak the truth instead of live in those negative core beliefs. So that was huge. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just one day at a time, one breath at a time. Right. And again, that permission and allowing ourselves to feel and, you know, deal. And I mean, there'd be times I'd be driving in my car just because there was, I just dropped off a kid or whatever. And I would just wail. I would just wail in my car, you know, at the top of my lungs. Hmm. I was so broken, you know, that um, my soul, you know, it was just, it was just, you know, trauma separates and fragments, you know, it, it, and so like, right. You lose connection with your soul, with your heart, with your gut, right. The gut has been eroded. Um, all the, you know, your survival and with, you know, everything, your mind, heart, soul, your part of your brain, this side of the brain, this side, I mean, everything's, everything's dismantled. It's all, it's all shattered. It's all fragmented. And so healing is doing the work to bring us back into wholeness and that deep work. And that's where I believe as horrible as all of this is, the beauty comes because we, when we do do that work, we actually end up finding our authentic self that we never even knew. Right. 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 And that's that, you know, like those uh, insignificant and some of the roles I took on with nothing but grace, you know, and love for my and compassion for myself, just understanding like, oh, that's the role I took on as a kid. And, and again, I was, I was taking that on, but losing myself in that. Right. And so that's not what, that's not my best self. I can help others and care for others and put myself as a priority. Right. You know? yeah. And so learning those things and realizing Again, God doesn't call me to go help everybody else and not, not myself or or my marriage and not myself. So I started to realize, wow. And I came up with a statement after yeah. the lawyer stuff, because everybody like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You know? <laughs> and I finally just said, you know what? I handed them over to God. I put the outcome on the shelf. Right. I'm focusing on my healing and my emotional health and being a mom for my kids. And I'm not in a rush to make any decisions and they accepted it. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, it felt again, it felt, I started to feel empowered because I was like, Whoa, you know, like that worked and that's in truth. It's, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't, you know, lying to myself. It was right. true. And I had to keep reminding myself, I don't have to make a decision right now. I don't. And again, if it was a different situation and I had to, I might have to, but that for me, it was not, it wasn't necessary. It was best for me to wait. So that's the thing. Sometimes it's, you know, am I able to wait? Do I need to do something and file? Do I need to make an exit plan? Do I need to have a safety plan? Do I need, for some people, it's a therapeutic separation. I have lots of clients, you know, that I help do a therapeutic separation or a safety plan, or, you know, their needs and boundaries, or they just need distance or they need whatever. I mean, everyone's journey is unique and different but we must know what is best for us in the moment. Always change our mind. Right. That's the other thing. We we get to choose. We get to choose. I mean, that's the thing, right? We didn't have choice choice and we didn't have choice and we didn't have voice. So now using our choice and our voice is, is where we gain, right? The healing and, and becoming more stable for ourselves and, um, you know, and my husband was out there. I mean, he was out there. So, so all that to say, then he ended up, so I'm starting to get into place. Like I'm good. Like, I don't think I even want this marriage. Okay. Like I was, you know, I was starting to not good, like better than I'm just more like, okay, reality. And like, I am worthy and wow, that's too bad. And then I started to realize, whoa, like this is what happened to him. And now he did this and he swore. I mean, he made a vow. Like he swore when when we got married, he would never be that man. I mean, that, right, right. Told me that, and he became that man and he became all five of those men, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so, um, 
you know, and he was drinking all the time. He was a mess, but I started to realize, wow, this isn't even about me. And wow, um, our, he abandoned our kids too. So this isn't even a personal thing. I mean, this is like- Yeah, it's powerful when we get to the point where we're yep. like, okay, if he was married to another woman, she would be going through that. And we realize, <laughs> wait, it has nothing to do with us. Nope, nothing. And so it's, and it's kind of empowering because just like you said, we get to choose and we get to have a voice and addiction eventually- wins and so what can I do to protect myself and what can I do to be as healthy as I can for me and my kids exactly that that's that those are the decisions that you do get right imperfectly perfect and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to grow you know and and all of those things and so um yeah so I was getting to that place and I was there hadn't been contact in quite some time and all of that and then um one night I was in church and I had prayed for him in a, like I had been praying for him in a very different way. Like he just kind of like, I feel sorry for him. I felt compassion. I thought, well, you know, you left a beautiful life. Like you, you chose this. Like we were so blessed in all ways, not I mean, financially, like with our kids, our our adopted kids, like, oh, so ministry, like business, you know, always. And it was like, and you, you chose to just throw it all away. Wow. And, and so anyway, I was praying for him and I felt led to send him a text. And that was not typically, I didn't do that. And I didn't even want a response at this point. So, I mean, that was my tell that I was, you know, healthy, right. And I was just like, I just said, prayed for you tonight. That's all. That's it. I didn't want any response, but he did respond right away and said, wow, I feel them. I'm miserable. And then he sent me a picture of a buck he shot and said, see that smile. It's fake. And that was sort of the beginning of us meeting at counseling. A few months later, we he agreed to meet me at counseling. So Karen had lots of boundaries. He did not get to come home. He, you know, we drove separately. Yeah. And um, and I know we don't have time for that, but there's a whole story with like Greg Laurie and like his whole Jesus Revolution um, movie that just came out. Like Greg Laurie was a big part of our story and he had seven fathers. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we were going to, he opened the Costa Mesa campus. Like the month we started going to counseling in Costa Mesa block away on Thursday nights. And so when we ended counseling, he had a brand new church campus open there. And, and my husband hadn't been to church in two years. And I told him I was going to go to that church and he started going with me. And it was the whole year long. he he actually recommitted his life back to God there in that church. Cause no one knew us. It was an hour from our home. He didn't have the shame there and no one knew us. And so he was going there and like, and so Greg Laurie was a big part of our journey. And so, you know how the movie came out recently? Well, he was playing here in the big plane, you know, at um, Jack Graham's church. And so we decided to go to the movie, you know, screening. Well, we went to actually, yeah, went to the church that morning. I'm sorry. We went to the church that morning to see, hear Greg Laurie speak. And, you know, that, I don't know if you've ever been, but the that church is, is massive. It's giant. Okay. It's, you know, okay. Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. And yeah. like, you walk in, they're doing a baby dedication and the whole place is like packed. And the usher brings us all the way down, moves the reserved seats and puts us behind Greg and Kathy Laurie. And I was like, oh my gosh, God. I always wanted to reach out to Greg Laurie and email and just tell him, you know, a little bit of our story. That's all, you know, and I got to tell him in person. Wow. A month ago. And it was like, so cool. It was like, what were the chance, all the seats in the whole entire place. And he brings us down right there, right behind them, moves the reserve things and puts us right there. And it was like, whoa. And I'm like, Hey, we're from California. You know, (laughs) I mean, there was that like shake hello time, you know, I was able to just like get it out there. Like it was awesome. So that was very cool. But, um, yeah. So long, long journey for that, but he ended up, he was, he lied for a whole nother year to the, one of the best counselors there is. Mm. So I always say to the women, so all that time he was cheating on me and, you know, and he had done it at our ranch in our home, my bedroom, our home, our home that we designed, I designed another place I had designed for us to go and our grandkids. And here we are in Texas now. And that could have been right, but we lost it. I mean, we ended up selling it and never went back again. I lost all the little things that I had spent time decorating and just, you know, not about material things, but just more my heart, yes, you know, yes, and, yes. Uh, and, and kind of, again, more hopes and dreams lost. And, um, but he, yeah, he had lied the entire year. She asked him directly point blank, if he'd been physically unfaithful, he said, no. And so I always share that with women saying like, you know, 
you think you were a fool because I had EMDR on that. I was a fool. I should have known. No, he lied to one of the best counselors there is. And, you know, and I mean, and she believed him. So, you know, it's not that we're full. We just, all we're doing is doing the best we can. And it's not our fault. They, sex addicts are good liars. Yeah. And, you know, and he was in deception and distortion. And so he ended up finally kind of doing the dump disclosure before they had therapeutic full disclosures. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he had come over and he, he dumped it all and I collapsed on the ground in total shock and trauma. So more shock and trauma. And that whole year we had been reconciling, the whole community knew this. So ours was so public because, well, so was yours. (laughs) Yours was very public. (laughs) So uh, yeah, you get it, right? You get it. And ours was public just in our whole community. And, um, you know, just that we both had been born and raised and with six kids and all that. But, um, and so they all thought we were like reconciling. And then I found out all this new information. So I just, I went into complete withdraw constriction you know isolation you name it and um I couldn't talk I couldn't drive I couldn't I mean it was just because I had settled that he hadn't crossed those flesh lines because he had told her (laughs) you know and so I believed that my body wanted to believe it yeah and so then there was all of that and it was very ugly and very messy for the next six months and then but he broke there I mean he was broken And he was willing to get really honest and, you know, basically, I mean, not a full therapy disclosure, but to the best they did back then with her. And she, I mean, she's now she's a CSAT and, you know, she's very well known and um, well, you know, her probably Dr. Sherry Keffer. She's, she's giving me permission to share. And so, um, you know, and now I get to coach, you know, I'm a coach with her in the Brave One community, which is awesome. But, you know, so much for me again, you know, is, is more about the restoration of our hearts and that I had to learn to attend to my soul, my brokenness, you know, and God, of course, too, but just that, you know, to reconstruct and rebuild all the things that, you know, the ways I was impacted and the losses and, um, you know, and find that authentic self. And it's a journey for all of us. And it's something we never, ever choose, but it's, you know, and it's important, I think, for, you know, for women to identify those harmful behaviors, to recognize where they lack safety, right? I mean, I wish I had that back then. So, I mean, now I have the awesome blessing of running groups and, and coaching women and all of that. And my husband, and I have couples group as well. And that's been really, you know, really cool, difficult, but really, you know, need to like support couples in on that for the last year and a half, you know, and, and now, you know, my husband learned that relational repair. He learned to hold my heart. He, you know, he understood like our attachment and we had to, you know, do work there with that. Um, but again, it, I think where the biggest part for me is, is us, is the, you know, the relationship can't even heal if we don't do, you know what I mean? If we don't put ourselves as a priority and recognize, you know, what do I want? Am I willing to, right? Like for, right it's uh, this is not going to work this is not going to work for me anymore or i'm not willing to do this or you know and and like, like again we have our group is like you know we've got people from 3 to 7 years in and and there's lots of struggles and you know sobriety doesn't equal recovery as right. you know and so there's a lot of intimacy issues a lot of you know deficits and defenses and and some abusive behaviors and if they're not willing to really de- dig deep dive into their underlying factors of how they were shaped and these abusive ways and all of that like my husband's done that you know he was willing I mean it's ongoing you know it things will still come up and you know a couple years ago did an attachment class he did this you know like is that's but that I've you know agreed that this is this is our journey and as long as you're in it and I'm we're both in it then we will continue but, you know, if he's to stop and say, I'm not doing this anymore or whatever, you know, I mean, we he had relapses long, like all those things, but, you know, it's about being honest. It's about consent. It's about, you know, uh, the mutuality. It's about moving towards secure functioning. Yeah. He has disorganized attachment and severe avoidance, right. From his childhood, but yeah. he, you know, I expect him. I mean, that's in my needs to, right. to work against that old working model, like right internal model. And that's his work to do. And as long as I see the effort, then, then that's what it is. But, um, 
you know, we need to have those people that are keep us in our truth and our reality. And we need to assess and reevaluate, like, you know, where we're at, where they're at, right? Because I mean, things get there when we moved here, things got complacent, right? And then it was like we didn't have the support we had there because we had graduated, like all the things. And and then he did get support here, but there was still things, you know, and it was just it's just this journey of, you know, and for some people, no, it's not, they're not going to be able to stay, you know, and that's, that's okay. I mean, it's, you know, everybody's journey is unique and, um, you know, we just, we've got to, um, you know, stand up for ourselves again, use our voice and choice and, and, and work through, there's so many losses and there's so much, you know, even in the coupleship, there's sexual trauma, there's, there's a lot. And I don't want to be pessimistic either, but it, sure, it's sure. realistic. You're just being you know? realistic. Yeah. Realistic. I think what you're saying is that really, no matter where we are, if we stay married, if we don't stay married, yep. if we stay separated, some people choose to stay married and just live. We live well and together. stay well. Exactly. You know, for financial so, reasons right. or whatever. Yeah. And so nobody can make the decision. That's for you, right. But the bottom line is you've got to get healthy no matter what. And exactly. if you're struggling as somebody with addiction that has been a long-term addiction, as well as the pathological lying, you need to be in some sort of ongoing learning and recovery and accountability forever for the rest Absolutely. of your life. Because the day you think, oh, I'm good, you know, which is what, exactly. you know, I was in is, oh, I'm so good. And like, that's, that's usually right where you were about yeah, to exactly. get over the head again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause just cause we're coaches or retro, whatever it, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. And we're just, we're right there together too. I mean, that's, you know, and, and we all know with addiction and stuff, you know, my husband, and again, he's vocal about, it. he has ADHD, you know, he, I mean, he had some disorders like there's, you know, yeah those things are, you know, they're, they're not easy. They've got lots of blind spots and, and things that again, they didn't choose, Yeah, you know, yeah. but it is their responsibility. And it's what I, for me, like, I need that. I need right. that right. commitment and requirement for you to continue to work and grow as right. I commit to myself. Right. You're going right. to get like Daisy and, you know, and yeah, he could do things like, you know, tend to overwork or whatever, you know, having our own business is the struggle here and financially and all, and it's all real stuff. Right. Yeah. But he knows, I know like that too busy thing, right. Is, is a, is a cop out or an unhealthy coping mechanism to, to withhold his heart and to not connect. And that still shows up sometimes. And I tell people all the time, I use my voice now though. And I'll be like, you know, I noticed that you, you know, this is, I'm noticing the distance and this is, you know, I'm not really okay with this. Right. But he knows he's got to come back and repair. And in the meantime, I'm not sitting around waiting for him. I've got a life. (laughs) So, so like he he knows that. And I mean, you know, and I know that. So it's like, it's like, I've got five grandbabies now I have, you know, I have people, I have my adult kids. I, I have coaching and a whole, you know, platform I'm blessed. And it's not that I wasn't independent before, but there's something unique about it different about it that is just like there's that interdependence thing you know but I think before I kind of just depended a little too much right I was a little too dependent on that and mind you all that crazy making does create ambivalence and uh anxiety and you know anxious attachment and that's not our fault I mean it makes us disorganized come here go away I need you and I you know crazy making already too right But, you know, when we, when we settle within our own souls and we do that work and lots of time and talk and tears, and we create, establish our own safety, you know, then we're strengthened and fortified. I I just read something before we came on about something I'd shared a long time ago. And I love like the word comfort because it, it, it means that um, the COM meant with like together, you know, like, so that's why we need community and everything. And then the fort is fortified and strengthened, you know? And so that's comfort is with another, yeah. you know, and it's, and it's, that's where we're strong and we're strengthened. And right. that's, you know, that's the beauty of this, right? You know, it as well as I do with the yeah. women that we have the honor, sacred honor to walk beside. And we get to people say, oh, how do you sit in that pain all day? And yeah, it's hard and it's pain and abuse and trauma. I mean, let's be real. That's what we sit in and hold. And we get to watch change happen and empowerment happen. And women, my husband always says to all the guys, because, you know, we work together. It's like, um, 
guys, watch out because you're your wife's going to get strong. She's going to start making her own decisions. Yeah. She's going to have yeah. boundaries. She's going to like. I think that's a lot of times where the content comes from. You know, Karen, yeah. you, you mentioned you started getting stronger and it was almost yes. like she would look with you, look, look at you with contempt. And that is what happens. If you are not doing the work, then you are going to get stronger and you're going to be stepping into your voice and you're going to, yep. and it's a beautiful thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. But if that is happening and say the and guy is not yep. doing the work and he's right. not doing the repair, then That's you right. just end up having this chasm. Exactly. And- exactly. Right. And there's been, you know, and I'm sure you've experienced too. I mean, we've had lots of issues with, you know, failed polygraph, like lots of things, you know, just lying and yeah. lying even in our community with, you know, with people and, um, with the man and the, or like all the things. Right. But I mean, the women are amazing because like, it's hard stuff, but they also realize like, had we not been together, had we not, you know, asked for that polygraph or asked for that disclosure, right. we wouldn't know this truth. Right. Right. Like, right. So these hard things come out and sometimes it's the dissolve of their marriage, but it's like, they also realize, Whoa, like I needed to know this. Right. Knowledge is power. Yes. And then that with that power, you can begin to go get the healing that you need. Yes. And make informed so decisions. All, and yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it, yeah, it just, it, I mean, it, it breaks my heart, but it's also so beautiful too. I mean, I've got lots yeah. of women walking through divorce and yeah. did just like you, did they ever, did you ever want it? Did you ever, I mean, right. It's like, no. no. <laughs> and so, you know, you get a choice to do with what you're going to do with that. Right. And does you know we we have a husband that doesn't who says we have to be like that's not i doesn't say that and you know and again i'm sure you came out we're stronger than we know and we come out with that authentic self and we learn to attend to our heart i mean now i know when i have a negative belief come up of course they still come up but i can attend to that i can check in with myself throughout the day i can notice what is happening in my body I'm connected to myself, you know, self-aware of my good, bad, and ugly or whatever. I give grace to myself. I can, you know, share my whatever. I can repair with the kid. I I mean, it's just like, you know, and even with like sisters and people, it's just like, it's just this maturity that, right? And I always say you can't be emotionally um, immature and be spiritually mature. It doesn't go hand in hand. No. Right. And, and God wants us to be mature. And you can't be in a relationship with somebody that you can't trust. And so that, you can't 100%. With honesty, not just repair. But oh, you have to be honest. Yeah. If you don't have safety or truth, yeah, can't be married. And you can't forgive what you don't know. Right. You know, and yeah. And if they're not willing to do that under the hood work of looking at their past, and my husband had ugly stuff, he withheld, he was sexually abused for 30, 28 years from me. You know, and that, I mean, he's wide open about it now, but like that, that little shame, you know, that drives some man, yeah. you know? And so it's like in that, he always says, you can't heal what's concealed. I mean, it's yeah. got to come out into the light. And if they're not going to do that, it typically, it was, it won't work. It won't work. I mean, God's good way. He designs that, that eventually it does combust. Yeah. You can't be in God and in the, in the dark, nope. you know what I mean? Like in him, there is no darkness. And so it's like, you know, sometimes again, we're faced with two bad decisions, hard decisions. Right. Yeah. You know, but, but there's a lot of goodness and beauty out of that, I believe. And again, never to dismiss the harm and the damage and the losses and the injustice. I mean, I think, I think those who end up being together, you know, the man has to understand that injustice and needs to repair that and make, you know, um, restitution. For that and be willing to like imperfectly but just you know knowing right. understanding the pain and the impact this has caused us and yeah. i know it's so hard for the men i mean it's hard you know some of them want to and it's just so hard i mean one of my girls shared today like she's still in the graveyard and he is over here not going well, into it's the- been six months it's been a year it's yeah. been <laughs> yeah. well yeah, and some, some, it's been, some, some has been five or seven yeah. Oh, he's never gone into the graveyard. He's never you grieved. You can go into empathy. It can be a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and feel it takes a thing. lot of work. For them the to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they need to, you know, there's another story, but the boundaries and like, they, they, they need to learn how to listen and hold the pain and feel the pain with boundaries. So right. that's the thing. If they have, if they stay in their inherent worth, 
while they hear the pain, right. they, they can contain it. Right. They don't have to go to shame. Yeah. Right. Cause they just wear it, you know, and then the shame's in the way of me and you connecting. Right. Yeah. And it's that self-protection over connection, but healthy love and boundaries is protection and connection. That's right. That's good stuff. So are your, how are your kiddos? Have they been on kind of a healing path themselves? Oh yeah. And, and my husband learned um, from the counselor to yeah. after, after we were stable, she, well, we had one son who didn't talk to him for a year and he lived in the home and, and my husband had moved back in and my son said, I'm not talking to him for a year. And wouldn't you know it on January 1st of the following year, he walked down the stairs and said, happy new year, John, <laughs> not dad, but John, but wow. you know what? he needed to know that he wasn't leaving again. Wow. He needed to know, you know, I mean, it was ugly. One of my kids met this other woman, like, I mean, ugly. She reached out to me, sent stuff, put it in a ranch. I mean, there's, you know, yuck, right? It was messy. There's no pretty bow or anything like that. But he went to each kid. And I remember I still have the emails, him saying, when you're ready to talk, I want to hear how I've hurt you and what it was like for you, how I hurt your mom. And he would go and he went to each one in their time, held the bag while some of them had machine guns, but he held it. No excusing, no minimizing, no defending, staying humble. And then the big key too is curiosity. Tell me more. What was that like for you? How does that make you feel? That taught us. I mean, my, our kids our later are two younger ones. I mean, they're great now. One of them has a girlfriend. He said, mom, it, it's helped me so much. Like I ask, I get curious. I ask her how she feels. I don't defend or minimize, you know, like he learned that from back then, you know, eight years ago, 10 years and, ago. And if you are, if, if you're new to this and you're hearing this conversation with Karen and myself and you're, and you're asking yourself, what well, is he repentant or is he remorseful or is he like, those are some benchmarks. Is he humble? Is he leaning in with curiosity? Is he willing to go to the to the kids or to, 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 yes. And be emotionally wife. honest and come out yeah. of portion of and, and take the pain. Yeah. And take the pain that he's caused other people, you know, is there still yes. pride and ego and blaming and, you right. know, all the, all the and walls up and yeah. even, like even said, like when, even when a man has some self-awareness that you're, we're in a conversation and it starts to get dysregulated, what well, could they need? We need to know how to regulate and co-regulate right. and step away and take right. a pause. Right. But, but for him to say, I'm feeling the wall come up. I need a break. Or Every even I'm feeling moment. shame. Give, give yeah, me a minute yeah. so that I can preach the gospel to myself. Exactly. Myself exactly. Yeah. Just, to, you know, can I have a minute? I'll be back. I just need to breathe a little bit and come back. Yeah. Like we're totally okay with that. That yeah. That's the thing. We're not, no one's looking for perfection. We nope. just want authenticity and vulnerability and transparency, you know, and, and humility. And, and I always tell the guy, it, if you honor what she needs, that's the only way you're going to get your needs met. Yeah. What's good for her is good for him. It's good for the marriage. Yeah. And it may not feel like it. He's going against all of everything he was molded, you know, shaped. But when he actually shows up for her and actually is vulnerable and, you know, humble, she, she moves in, we move in. Yep. Yeah. And then he gets his needs met. Because I'll just say, what about me? What about, oh, trust me. If you do this, you will get this. That's the beauty of how God created us to be. God is a God of intimacy. Yeah. He wants us to be fully known yep. with each other and with him. Yeah. So, you know, it, otherwise it won't work. That's right. That's right. And we're worthy. Any we're closing worthy. Things. Yeah. Why don't you tell people how to get in touch with you? Okay. Um, the website is redeeming-love.com. And, um, it's also, I also have the coaching, which is restored hope.coach, but it all goes to the same place. So just okay. redeeming love.com. And we have the couples group redemption road. That's all on there. And, um, yeah. And then Instagram, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and, um, you see me on summits and awesome podcasts like yours, Melody. And I th thank you so much for letting thank me you. share. And I hope I encourage some hearts just, yes. you know, I mean, I think if there's any, beautiful takeaway and i i got this from you as well and 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 such a believer in this it's like regardless of what, of what has happened to you 
no matter what you go through over the course of your life, you get control. And that control is the choice to step in to a counselor's room and to say, I need to process this pain. I need to work through this because otherwise it will own you. Exactly. So you, you, you get that choice. You don't yep. get, you, you don't get to choose what has happened to you, but you do get to. That's choose right. That. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And we, a lot of us have traumas and all of that and life is hard and the struggle, but I believe, you know, how do you, if we can't have joy without the struggle. I'm not saying I like the struggle. I'm just saying, you know, but there's is purpose. There's purpose out of our pain, the growth and the healing journey. I mean, I've never met a woman that's gone through this who hasn't, you know, eventually come out stronger and better. And none of us would wish it upon anybody. Right. No, not but, at all. And I also believe we're all going to be up in heaven one day in a special place with God, with Jesus dancing, you know, with no pain, no more tears, right. you know, and, and we can change the trajectory of our kids, even though, you know, even if our husbands don't and, you know. Yeah. And I would say, you know, not even just our kids, like we literally get to change oh, yeah. the world around us, you know, whether we're in Absolutely. the supermarket or in, you know, a, a fitness class That's or right. whatever, That's like right. we literally get to use those recovery tools and engage and have eye contact and exactly a tune. And, and, and like with my grandbabies, I like, uh, you know, like now, of course, like we all made our mistakes, as, you know, our kids and well, that never ends. We still repair there. Sure. But like I, my little grandkids, they, they have two, the twins have severe ADHD. They, I get to teach them tools for regulating themselves. And they're like, nanny, I was at school and I used the candle, you know, five-year-old telling me that they were blowing the candle and, and just that, you know, I look them in the eye and mirror them. And like, you know, so they're seen and known and like the things that, you know, with six kids, I, ah, you know, and things were hard and all things. And I did the best I could and they're great kids. I mean, our kids, but but, you know, it's like so beautiful that I could actually be present with them. Like, I don't, I, you know, I wouldn't have had this if, again, just the journey of healing. Let's just say that. I mean, you know, that has taught me about life. It's taught me about myself. It's taught me about being with people and being with myself. I mean, that I think, you know, yep. just that I can attune to my own needs and I have, I'm allowed to have needs. I'm a mom of six. I yes. have needs, you yes. know, like my needs are valid. And everyone knows before my feelings are not up for debate. <laughs> right. Love that from a type four. So, I mean, <laughs> exactly. and you know what else is redeeming? What else is redeeming is fun fact about a type four on the Enneagram. They sit in pain better than any of the other Enneagram types. And That's so true. God uniquely wired you to be who you are, but how interesting yes. that you sit in women with pain all day as an emotional type four. Isn't that, isn't that, but in my healing, I used to take care of them over me, right? Like that, right. but I don't I would just get to hold space for them. Now I just hold space and sit in that. And, and yeah. And, and you know, that's what people go, how do you do that? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like no, <laughs> it's the biggest blessing ever. My go my daughters are like, because <laughs> I'm just, like, it's death and resurrection. Who wouldn't want to do that? Right. Exactly. I mean, it's kingdom work. We're on the front lines. We're on the yeah. battlefield, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. It's messy, mucky, but yeah. it's also beautiful yeah. out of the dust, you know? Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm excited about getting this out and um, just, yeah, hope it'll breathe hope into many, many lives. I hope so too. And I just thank you for allowing me to share and just yeah. an honor to be with you today. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. This episode has been brought to you by Life Beyond Betrayal. Life Beyond Betrayal is a comprehensive program that provides a community as well as three courses for women. The first course is Surviving Trauma Beyond Betrayal. Our second course is called Grieving Beyond Betrayal. And the third course is called Reclaiming You Beyond Betrayal. This is a self-paced program that you can take as long as you want to go through and also provides a community so you feel like you have the support that that you need. So check out Life Beyond Betrayal membership at lifebeyondbetrayal.com.